Hi guys, welcome to another episode of our podcast, Talent First. Today we have a leader who has very, very unique takes on certain nuances of building a career or building a career in engineering, in analytics, in AI. She's currently the director of engineering at the Thomson Reuters Labs. Reuters as we all know it, Thomson Reuters. So hi Shrisha, hi, how are you? Hi Raghav. How are things going? So nice to meet you today. Things are absolutely fine. Perfect. Just like I told you, we will try to talk to you in Hindi. We will try to talk to you. We will try to talk to you. We will try to talk to you. I will explain to you in Bengali. Okay. Okay. Sometimes Bengali. Done. Done. Perfect. So, let's start with the elevator pitch. Sure. Who are you? Um, uh, if you ask me who I am, I am a mother. Hmm. I am a wife. I am a daughter. But I'm also somebody who's very excited that I work with AI. Hmm. And, you know, I think that's my identity, that, hmm. you know, I get to uh, learn new technologies, apply hmm. them in my work, um, and make a difference to the world, I think, hmm. right? Hmm. Uh, I want to believe it that way, and hmm. it's, uh, I've been lucky, you know, hmm. with this belief and, you know, doing the best that I can with this hmm. so far. How do you define luck? Luck, so... Um, I have a feeling that, you know, whenever I want something, mm. it comes to me. Mm, mm, mm. And people around me tell me that you're really lucky. Mm, mm. Um, but maybe, you manifest it. Yeah, maybe I, um, you know, I want the things that mm. I get, mm, mm. you know, the other way around. Mm, mm. I don't know, but I, I would think that I'm really lucky. And so I've been uh, getting good opportunities, mm, mm. Um, uh, all the, you know, ticking all the right boxes in my life. Mm, and mm. look at me today, I'm talking to you. So mm. there's that last bit of right, luck as well. Right. Perfect. I think we are lucky that you're here. <laughs> so now let's go a bit deeper. Let's go back, uh, understanding your childhood a bit. So you were born in, in Bengal. I was born in um, Bengal, West Bengal. Where in Bengal? Um, some place called Adra. It's near Purulia district mm. of West Bengal. Mm -hmm. um, and then my dad moved to Bangalore uh, on his job. And so we as a family moved what, to How old were you when you moved to Bangalore? I was two years old. Oh, when so I you, moved you have no Bangalore. memories of... Very little memories. And in mm. fact, I don't associate myself much with West Bengal, although I do know Bengali. Mm -hmm. um, and then since I was two years old, I've lived in Bangalore. Uh, my dad used to work in HMT. Hmm. Um, the watch, the watch yeah. yeah. So they used to have those watches in cricket stadium, absolutely, right? Absolutely. HMT was a big thing. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Um, so I think every company has their time under yeah. the sun. Or I, I have a very small story about HMT. You do? So my mom actually topped mm -hmm. the 12th board mm -hmm. in CBSE in okay. India. Okay. And the president of India called her on the 26th of January mm -hmm. uh, for the Republic Day uh, celeb like parade where they award the students mm -hmm. and he gifted her a HMT watch. Mm. So that's a HMT. I, wow. So HMT is something which I have heard. Yeah, HMT was this was big, big brand. Yeah? yeah, big brand yeah. and big opportunity. Students would want to intern, yeah. you know, with yeah. HMT workshops. Yeah. It was a big thing. Um, so yeah, that that's uh, mm. that's how we started in Bangalore. Mm. Mm. Um, and I think I did my schooling, Clooney Convent High School. Uh, mm. Not many people may know in Bangalore, but I have quite a few of my classmates still here in Bangalore who live near where mm. I stay. We meet often. Um, and then I did my 11th and 12th in NPS. That's also a very known name. Mm. Um, uh, consequently, I also um, topped CBSE in my 12th Ooh. in Bangalore. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So when, when you spoke about your mom, I remembered. Yeah. Uh, and then again, I think I was really lucky because, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I got 95.6. <laughs> that time? Uh, yeah. This was what, 1998. Very yeah. big deal. Is it? Wow. Okay. <laughs> wow. Did you ever cheat? Yeah. Uh, no. Indian school? <laughs> no, no. no. Don't lie, please. <laughs> no, no. So, see, we had this convent education, right? Yeah. Um, uh, so, the God thing and, you know, God is yeah, watching yeah. and all of that was a big mm. thing. So, mm. I don't remember. You were Bengal jati thi, like for vacations? I was going to go to Bengal. So, um, I think my last Durga Puja in West Bengal, Kolkata was in 1994. After that, I haven't seen a Basically, Durga Basically, till you were like 16, 15, 16, you used to go to? But basically, I am trying to understand in your formative years, hmm. because I will tell you why I am so, uh, I want to know about Bengal, because they had a communist regime. They did. And people who were part or around that communist regime, hmm. you talk to them now, you see that, hmm. that social, that, that there is some level of 
a familiarity you see there yeah, there is yeah, the, some yeah. pattern you see there yeah, yeah. that's what i'm trying to understand did it influence you lekin mujhe nahi sorry nahi wo influence nahi aayi sorry okay. uh, but every summer holiday during my school years right we mm. went to my grand maternal grandparents house which was in nagpur and nasik mm. so maharashtra, uh, maharashtra. so mm. i think i spent two two year two two months wow. every year there mm. um you know with my cousins with my grandparents i was very fond of my grandmother grandfather mm. as well mm. um uh, we used to uh, write a lot we used to write these uh, newspaper articles together we used to play scrabble together so wow. i've had you know a lot of uh, fun times with my grandparents as a child were you uh, in a delicate way a nerd Because ninety five percent that sounds like a nerd. <laughs> It sounds like a nerd. I'm just curious. But I'll tell you one thing, right, Raghav? I mean, all this thing is there about you know what are you going to grow up and become, mm -hmm. right? Um, I don't share this very often, but you know, in tenth standard, when the teacher was asking, you know, I want to hear what you guys want to become. Yeah, so, yeah, air yeah. hostess, engineer, yeah, yeah. cardiothoracic surgeon, wow. um, pilot. You know, so it was a um, bunch of girls who were saying this, and in my mind, I was like, I want to be a mother. Okay. You said that. No, I wanted <laughs> to say that, but I, people around me were all these, you wow. know, um, high fangled mm. ideas. I was like, I should say something. Let me just say, I'm going to become a doctor. <laughs> mm -hmm. But you know, in my mind, mm. you know, I felt like that's something that I want to become. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, luckily, I did get to become yeah, yeah, <laughs> a yeah. mother. Right. Right. But also that you know. Very interesting. Uh, yeah. Mm. That that you know. Uh, I don't know if we ever hear somebody who just wants to be a mother, mm. right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we don't, right? Why is that? Why why know. are like girls why. who might think like that hmm. uh, apprehensive hmm. about admitting it? Yeah, maybe it's um you know, it's it's not enough or what, right? Hmm. Do hmm. we do we feel that way? I wonder, yeah. Hmm. Hmm. So, if we look at your childhood, right? Hmm. Hmm. In everyone's childhood there are certain aspirations. Mm -hmm. Again, I do understand motherhood or being a mother is one thing you wanted to do, yeah, but yeah. there would be certain aspirations in your heart. Yeah. And those aspirations can be materialistic. Yeah. They can be holistic, whatever they are. So, yeah, yeah. can you talk to us about? So that heart um, aspiration was to be a mother. Hmm, hmm, okay. Hmm. Um, but maybe the other aspirations were like, okay, I need to study well. I need to do well. How was your social economic background as a child? So my father was an HMT, like I mm. said. Um, he was doing well. I think around my twelfth, he took a voluntary retirement. Mm. He moved to a different uh, job. I think he was part of this Dynamatic Technologies. They make gears and pumps for mm. aircrafts, tractors, etc. Mm. Um, so he had the rest of his career there. Um, I after my twelfth, I went on to um, joining computer science in Bits Pilani, and I think I was very lucky because mm. back then. Bits Pilani didn't have an entrance test. How did you get in then? So they were doing it based on 12 standard marks. Wow! Like I told you, I am lucky. Wow! Okay. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that really clicked for me. Um, uh, Bits Pilani is also where I met my husband. He was two years my senior from what, college. What was the gender ratio in Bits Pilani? Back then, when it was based on marks, it was much better. I hear than really? it is today. Yes. Okay, very interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Mm, uh, mm. One should really analyze mm, why mm. it's shifted now, mm. but back then I think it was more um, equal, somewhat. That you know. Uh, I think the reason behind that is places like Kota, because possible. because what possible. has happened is that these entrance exams mm. have become sort of like a coaching center mm. oriented. Mm. Uh, yeah. structure which yeah, yeah. a lot of uh, females yeah. would not be comfortable in yeah and i'll tell you this is other aspect um which maybe just my hypothesis Jeez. right that uh, maybe guys are more okay to do drop years to prepare for a really good college. agreed agreed women have that biological clock clicking yeah, ticking yeah, in their yeah. head already and they're like okay i've got to finish this mm -hmm, this this mm -hmm. this this before i'm turning 30 so i better get on with it yeah yeah so possibly that and maybe women are okay to you know compromise go to another college or what mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. very interesting possible yeah so b before you were in bits pilani yeah what did you think yeah uh, how how did you think college would be and how did it actually turn out to be hmm. it's not the same right i'm sure it's different yeah, than what you thought yeah yeah did you imagine you will find your husband there no definitely not <laughs> but i'll tell you right so i didn't think i was going to study engineering 
Mm. You remember I said I, I, I said I would become a doctor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I was all set to take up medicine. Then what happened? Okay. In fact, my um, the in, the entrance exam marks for medicine was also very the much higher. Are, yeah, than are. for engineering. Mm. But then I got into bits, which was on my twelfth marks, and everybody was like, "How could you not take this chance?" Um, and you know, my grandfather, whom I was very close to, uh, he was a heart patient, and mm -hmm. I was like, "One day I will treat you and things Achha. like that." Okay? I like it. So, mm -hmm. but in my twelfth, I lost him. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, somewhat that yeah, dream, yeah. That, that, you know, shook that motivation. That to be motivation <laughs> went. Yeah. Um, my uncle did remind me, and he said, like, you know, you said you always that you'd go become a doctor. Why are you doing this? Mm. I said, no, 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 this is a good college. Everybody's yeah, telling yeah, me, you know, yeah. I'll have a bright future. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to go. And somehow it seemed easier, maybe, mm -hmm. right? Mm. So we just, I just, you know, opted for um, mm. that Bits Pilani seat. Mm. Yeah. And when you went to Bits Pilani, right, let's say at your heart, you are not an engineer. Or yeah. what I've seen is people, a lot of people who get into engineering, at their hearts, I've always known that they will get into engineering. Yeah. So that's why they start thinking like engineering yeah. at a very yeah. early age. Yeah, yeah. Now you go there. Yeah. My assumption is you would have not felt the smartest. Yeah. In a, in a simple way, you would have felt a bit... Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't use the word dumb, but you will have felt... No, very intimidating. Yeah, like where am I? Yes. Did you and feel that? Absolutely. And, um, you know, uh, the good colleges are always like that, right? So they have got the best students coming from different parts of the country. Yeah. And I would be in awe. Okay, mm -hmm. and um, not just with their, you know, uh, what they could do academically, yeah, yeah. but their clothing, their attitude, yeah, their personality yeah, that they're yeah. bringing. And I would feel so shrunk mm -hmm. and like, what am I doing? And so I think I took shelter that, you know, I'm just going to be a good student, you mm -hmm. know, <laughs> right? That happens, mm -hmm. right? Let me just do that, which I think I'm good at, mm -hmm. which is to, you know, regularly attend classes. You were like a front bencher. Yeah, front bencher. Okay, <laughs> Take nice. notes, mm -hmm. do the stuff that I'm supposed to do on time, right? Mm -hmm. So I think my focus was, you know, mostly on being a good student. I have often attended classes where I'm the only student because Bits Pilani used to not have this attendance thing. Oh. Okay, so, um, and Pilani had these very bad winters and sometimes I used to be the only person attending the class with the wow. teacher. So you were a nerd. Yeah. <laughs> like I said, not a nerd, like I, I wanted to ensure I was doing my duty. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah? yeah, yeah. My dad's paying this heavy fees here, mm. I better, you know, mm. at least do this, mm. <laughs> right? Mm. So there's this baggage that we carry at all mm. point of time mm. when mm. I need to do my duty thing. Yeah, yeah. And so that was, uh, you know, I think what college life mm. w went as for me, you can so say. So in your final year, right, that's when the campus placements and yeah. thoughts around that yeah. start arising. Yeah. What were areas, uh, at, this is 2001? No. 2001, yeah, because 2002, June, July, I graduated. So this is like post Y2K. Yeah. Where IT as an industry was shaky. Was shaky. Yeah. And a lot of people, old school people, found a good way to critique it. Yeah. Who, because people who could not jump in that bandwagon. This was going to fall. Kind this of, is gone yeah. and all of that kind yeah, of yeah. thing, right? Yeah. So what did you think? Where would you go and why? Yeah. So a lot of my um, batchmates had started applying for their masters. Achha. Yeah, but I was very keen that I'm going to work, okay, and... Masters uh, to the U.S. and stuff. Masters to the U.S. or, you know, maybe MBA or whatever, sure, right? Sure, sure. Uh, CAT, they were going to prepare for CAT, yeah, they yeah. were writing GREs or TOEFL, um, and I was very keen that I would work, right. okay? And so, uh, my final semester, which was, I think, the fourth year, first sem, yeah, yeah. In, so that's when we also had the placement time. Mm -hmm. Now... Um, Imagine the pressure. So I've decided I will work. Hmm. But the first few companies that came to hire had already hired, let's say, my batchmates who were not going to take it. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't yet secured a job offer. Okay, mm -hmm. So I think that was one of those stressful Stressed. times in life. Um, and, and I remember like, you know, uh, calling home, crying, this is not working mm -hmm. out, I know what I've mm -hmm. done, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then it, I think eventually when I got... Um, uh, an offer from Oracle, ah, that mm. relief, I'm just able to go back to that mental mm. state. I can still, mm. you know, <laughs> that mm. state, right? Mm. I, lo I love to ask people about their starting salary in their career. Yeah. Uh, what was your starting salary in Oracle? I, I think it was three lakhs per annum. Mm. It was big, right? It was big. It was big, yeah. I, I, what did, like, I'm, uh, again, I felt very lucky. You felt very lucky. <laughs> yes. You are a very grateful person yes, in life. Yes, yes, I am really That grateful. helps. Yeah. So in Oracle, right, like, Tell us what was your job mm. and tell us some things that if you could go back, you would do differently. 
in your first job because normally the way we set our routine yeah the way we set our discipline yeah in our first job is how our career is the trajectory of that career happens sort of goes so if right? we can always introspect mm. there are areas everyone has for improvement mm. in the first job they did yeah yeah so oracle right i think i was um, a little short sighted hmm. and you know you think you're going to do these big things yeah, right yeah. and then you don't realize that you're starting at um at a pyramid like yeah at base. the lowest rung of yeah, the yeah. pyramid you don't really matter basically. yeah you not just you don't really matter but um you probably are like bricklaying at a very very ground level right so that's i think uh, what do you say humility dose of humility that you get because you coming from college where you were like yeah, fourth yeah, year you're yeah. the you know power don bits you know, planning, bits planning yeah. and all of that and then you start here um but uh, i always look at my first year of job raghav um with this you know we were a bunch of youngsters hmm. in a new city with a with a lot of money this is bangalore uh, no oh. this was hyderabad oracle and that time hyderabad was not developed not developed so it, like whatever salary we got felt like a lot of money yeah right? yeah yeah and we were like wow what are, what are we going to do yeah. every weekend we had plans sorry we were totally yeah. <laughs> you know that mm. was this uh, really fun time mm. it was mm. college what do you say was on dad's money yeah. right so yeah. this was this <laughs> you is know true freedom. this was very much yeah, yeah. a lot of freedom mm. and uh, um and and uh you know i think i made a good bunch of friends yeah mm, i've always had good friends mm-hmm. right so uh my roommates and you know other colleagues who who were in a bunch so we would make plans to go out so that first year of job mm-hmm. was more about that friends group yeah and less about oracle mm. but sorry to mm-hmm. <laughs> not give you the right answer there yeah yeah but i'll tell you so soon after that i moved to motorola which was in bangalore which where also i had done my internship mm. and uh, that What was made a little more one i wanted to come back to bangalore and you remember how i had these visions that i was going to do this and yeah, that and yeah. oracle was more you know plumbing kind of yeah, work yeah. so this was um, we were developing handset software and motorola was a very consumer facing brand consumer so facing. a lot of bragging rights as a young i'm just trying to think yes right? yes that too that right, too, that look i'm working on motorola. the school thing yeah, right yeah, yeah. and back then uh, motorola was a big deal hmm. right so um, i was buying phones for family members oh, razer and, uh, razer and uh, you know those uh, the the blackberry time yeah, as yeah, well right? yeah, yeah. so um, i think that was a fun time where we were developing hands at software um i was in this team um i think i told you this earlier as well like 2004 we were developing a phone which would have wifi and phone calls which is gsm or 2g in the same phone at that time at that time wow and uh, obviously it was ahead of its mm. time mm. it didn't it didn't click mm. right mm. um but nonetheless it was an amazing experience and i think up uh, that's where i got this um on the track of innovation right like mm. you need to be ahead mm. you know not just building the solution which is mm. being there but right like just being ahead of it as yeah, well yeah yeah so um it was a lot of new things being done for the first time mm. um the tech leads who were you know yeah. uh, leading us were really intense really um uh, very good tech leadership mm-hmm. that i you know mm-hmm. had mm-hmm. Uh, in that team but that stint unfortunately didn't last for very long uh, motorola was not doing well um i had to move to lucent technologies around 2005 this alcatel yeah lucent technology soon became alcatel lucent mm. um but those were those mm. you know mm. i i think i spent close to a decade there mm. uh working in alcatel in alcatel lucent close to a decade yes yes almost yes wow so we were Why? working what was so special about our company one was i think i had very good managers very good uh, uh you know environment the culture was really good um we were learning from each other and um and, and, and in general i think uh, pers- in my personal life as well a lot of changes were happening mm. so altogether um that you know balancing both right it worked out very well for me mm. so around that time i had my kids uh, that decade right i had my kids um wow. they started to grow so you know all of that came together mm. very well mm. and that amazing journey i think lasted till 2013 or 14 where alcatel started to sell off their 3g division to mm. hcl right and and i didn't want to mm, you know move enough. with that so i have an observation to make right and this is something i've seen yeah normally when it like 
females when it's come to maternity leave mm. when it comes to motherhood yeah when their employer supports them their loyalty goes through the roof yeah absolutely is that absolutely. is that also the case with absolutely you? raghav i mean um even today if i think back to the to the manager i had at that time yeah. um and to the mentors i had at that time uh, i think i didn't fall off the carriage only because of them right mm-hmm. um i don't know if i told you this but one of my harshest fights at home with my husband was after maternity when i had to get back to work i didn't want to go back really no why my my best friend was happily taking this break just yeah. raising her kid why yeah. shouldn't i do the same mm-hmm. right uh, people around me mm-hmm. were you know taking career breaks mm. i was looking forward to one such break yeah. and my husband was like if somebody gets to sit at home i'll sit at home you go i get <laughs> you know? that's equality so, so that yes. that was um, i felt unfair and, you know <laughs> so mm-hmm. uh, obviously mm-hmm. you know we had a, a clash and you know eventually i, I remember <laughs> that walk on which we eventually agreed that okay we'll mm. do this together so yeah. i will go to office half a day you will go to office half a day and the other half we'll see if our managers agree that we work from home that back then work from home was not a thing how did that happen like so i had a, i again i was very lucky i had a very very supportive manager and wow. i had very good mentors as well wow uh, to whom i even now i think you know even for your husband them. like his company allowing that yeah even he had very supportive managers yeah, right yeah yeah so really i think this was something that we just managed i would say mm-hmm. um so even today when you know women come to me and say like you know i don't know how this is going to work and i tell them hang on it will work you just have to go with the flow no, i, I want to go a bit deeper into this topic around uh, returnee yeah. like women who return from maternity breaks yeah yeah uh like this is a problem that is really rampant yeah where once they have a child yeah for th- their from them to get back yeah is very tough and there are many reasons behind that because a their expectations they they want to start at the level where they stopped yeah and it's tough to match that because the market is competitive yeah, yeah. and b a lot of companies have biases yeah that now you will have more responsibilities yeah. will you be yeah. able to yeah. give your full so what is your take on this this is a problem i'm sure yeah yeah how do you think we can tackle it so you're talking about women who've taken a break right yes i'm saying that let's say there's there's this lady who had a child and she took a break she took a break right so for them to come back you know the biggest hurdle they face even before we talk about the employer right they feel their skills have gone stale and sometimes maybe it indeed has gone sure, stale sure. right um so they are wondering you know how they could catch up mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. one they they have that pressure that i'm not going to be as good as i was yeah. right um and of course from the employer side as well there's that thing you know like you said will they be able to balance but i think um we are at a time raga where there are a lot of employers who are welcoming back these women Gee. open arms right mm. um they know that this is going to take time to stabilize probably they are not okay with late hours and things like that yeah yeah but um i i think they see the value in getting you know these women back um I, i and competitive salaries like you're saying maybe is a challenge or what in certain mm-hmm. um certain profiles uh, but nonetheless i think you know one women need to accept i need to pick up i need to you know maybe reskill reskill to a certain extent or figure out what the market needs if i'm looking to come back um and there are a lot of platforms right where women could pick up those skills uh, a lot of channels where you know uh, once you are going in you are able to guide the channel guides you to a hmm. um certain kind of profile which is more marketable right so in d- during your maternity break did you upskill yourself or did you do something around no, that no i didn't i you told didn't. you my maternity break i was going looking Chilling. at nesting Chilling. yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> so but hmm. um but that's your learning yeah but that's my learning and i didn't have such a long break i came back after 8 months hmm. um and uh, to my horror we were you know fixing the same issues which i left like you know the telecom software which were deployed and we i had you know i remember this one bug that i had fixed before i went on maternity hmm. and i come back and see that somewhere between code merges and Still this there. and that yes we've oh, wow <laughs> we've hmm. undone that fix hmm. Hmm. so i remember the first bug that i fixed after coming back was the same thing i left and i was <laughs> like oh no <laughs> no one is working there no one so yeah so i think um hmm. you know that was not a 
um, break which you know needed me to sure. reskill or whatever. Sure. But uh, it's a altogether different game balancing um, your duties towards yeah. the child, yeah. the sleepless nights, the sickness that your kid is going to have. Mm. I've gone on negative leave balance. I've had again very supportive bosses. I was minus seven leave balance, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, because of you know once you start putting your child in daycare, they fall sick that much more. Really? And, yeah. Daycares are petri dishes or whatever. Wow, okay. <laughs> yeah, so uh, then they, uh, again, you know, that sickness just goes on and on in Bangalore. Mm -hmm. Bangalore, every season we all fall sick, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. 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 So, uh, and imagine that in the daycare, like that just keeps happening more mm -hmm. and more because other kids are sick. Yeah, yeah. Right? And so um, you just have to go that first two years. Hmm. Very challenging, but you'll get through it, I think, eventually. Hmm. But uh, fair enough, fair enough. So, in Alcatel, you were there for 10 years, 9, yes. nine, nine, yes, nine, yes, nine yes, 10 years. Yeah. And my understanding is you saw the company very close up. Yeah. Now, Alcatel, to my understanding, hmm. it has been in the telecom industry, but B2C, hmm. it could never really figure it out. Hmm. What I mean by that is like having their own. Uh, headset like yeah, handsets yeah. and all of that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm, I don't know too much about it, but my understanding is they are very B2B oriented. They were. So they, they used to mostly sell the telecom stack software uh, to telecom operators, hmm. right? Their B2C space was mm, like that said, great. not that great. And I, I think they didn't um, continue why, that for why? very long. Um, what are your thoughts? I would think that maybe, you know, the folks who led the product side, right? Maybe they didn't bridge it right. Is it to do with the DNA? Because what I have been analyzing a lot of companies and what I'm realizing is the B2B DNA and the B2C DNA are Very counter, uh, like yeah. they're against, conflicting. Yeah, yeah, but some companies do manage that very well, right? Like Amazon. Like, like the Amazon. I was going to say Amazon, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, um, and, I, and I guess like, you know, you need to maybe have different kinds of people manage, right? I mean, that's how Amazon does it. Yeah. Um, in the case of Alcatel, I don't remember, sure, frankly sure, speaking, sure, Raghav, sure. very well. But I do remember that their uh, 3G space and with telecom, what was happening is, right, like um, the cost margins for an operator was very low as well. So for you to pump back that much amount of money into forward-looking stuff was really tight, mm -hmm. right? So it, it, it's, a, it's not a very profitable business, unlike e-com, right? Mm -hmm. E-com where you can get those yeah, margins yeah. more easily. Hmm. So, um, I think that's one challenge which sure. they couldn't sustain for very long. So, you've stayed in telecom for quite some yeah. time. Motorola, yeah. Alcatel, yeah. Nokia. Yeah. Uh, now, one thing we have seen is that, you know, initially the early parts of your career, mm -hmm. you tend to work in a domain and as you mature, as you become a leader, mm. you hope that that domain itself becomes big mm. and you get benefits of that. Mm. But what happened, my understanding is that telecom completely shifted. Mm. It the, the smartphone, the androids, the apples of the world really changed the way we look at telecom. Mm. And all of these these companies, the industry, you were sort of building your Neve, mm. your foundation. Mm -hmm. That industry sort of crumbled. Yeah. So tell us a bit about what went wrong mm. in the overall telecom industry mm -hmm. all of these incumbents like motorola or nokia yeah. according to you what was what did they not do right mm. and tell us at a personal level what it what it what it costed you yeah so i'll tell you that you know i i used to always wonder why they didn't get into the B2C space, mm -hmm. right? Um, I mean, today I think it seems like, yeah, obviously you would have services, yeah, the OTT, yeah, right? Yeah, the OTT yeah. space. But back then, right, they were so busy setting up the plumbing for your, mm -hmm. you know, internet, for your data connection. Yeah. And why didn't they sell services? Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's what would, you know, um, uh, that's what would, I think, truly shake. And G. back then, I think the thought process was, you know, so like, l let's say there's an Alcatel or there's a Nokia. So they would mainly work mm. with operators. Mm. They, there wasn't so much thought process of what it's going to take to get to that, you know, maybe to the B2C space, sure. right? Uh, and, and to start doing like I say, a Netflix or a Google, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that hurt them, mm. that uh, not having that, you know, maybe future view sort mm. of has hurt them, right? Mm -hmm. And so they've remained forever in that uh, plumbing Zone. space. Um, if I compare that to a Reliance, right? They were able to, um, 
shift, right? Gears, able complete to shift gears. gears, right? And not just do plumbing and handsets and network, but also do you know other stuff which are built backward over forward integration. Yes, so that's something that I think you know I'm really proud that New Reliance was able to figure it out and do well. Hmm. Um, and and so what happened is like let's say for somebody like me who's been in telecom, so I I knew um, it's the, going down. the call stack very well. We suspected it because, you know, LTE came, but, you know, there's only this much funding or whatever. Yeah, yeah. The, the thing is, um, what, what it hit us personally, right, Raghav, was that the jobs became fewer and fewer, right? We were less and less marketable. And that's, uh, that's one of my actually, you know, most um, depressing downtimes in my mm. career, right? When I didn't feel lucky at all mm -hmm, was mm -hmm. when... Uh, I, I think at, at that point, of, there was this one period of time where I was applying to so many jobs and not one clicked. Hmm. I had like, you know, bunch, I was sitting like on a pile of rejects. <laughs> yeah? hmm. Hmm. And I'm like, I think my skills are dead. Hmm. I need to do something. And of course, I'm saying this now, but back then I cried a lot. I right? can imagine. Yeah. And yeah. there were, you know, sleepless nights, like, what am I going to do? How am I going to? And then at that point of time, you also have these financial commitments. Your yeah. family is there. And, yeah. you know, yeah. um, you, you want to still remain that good girl hmm. where I'm doing things right. right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think it took a lot of pause introspect, reset, do a little bit of research, what are those new skills that I need to acquire. And I'm glad I went through that dark night because um, that's when I really realized that I need to get into data. So before we get into that part, one, one, one thought that I have is that, you know, our success is a lot to do with the industry, the industry that we are in. Mm. And uh, I don't know if you've seen the podcast we did with Pankaj, Pankaj yeah, Rai. Yeah, that's the first one I've seen. So he says that, right, that we are sometimes riding the industry waves. Yeah. For good or for bad. I thought of myself when I uh, saw that podcast. Yeah. yeah. So now, as a person who's starting their career, mm -hmm. do you think they should look at a macro of the industry they're getting in or just focus on the work they're doing? It's a very... Yeah, debatable it's, question. it's a debatable question. And uh, if I, like you said, if I look back to Oracle, my first job, what do I think? And I think that, you know, it's a 70-30, right? Or maybe even 75-25. So focus your maximum time still on your skills. On, Intrinsic. Yes, on your depth that you acquire to do your work well. But uh, you must also zoom out occasionally to see, you know, where is this headed? Hmm, what hmm. am I really building? What is the difference I'm creating to society, hmm. right? Uh, and that's important because that overarching view is going to continue, hmm, right? Hmm, hmm. The skill thing, you'll have to relearn, relearn, relearn again and again and again. But that overarching view of, you know, this is what Oracle does to the world hmm. or this is what is Mo Motorola's impact to the world. I confess I haven't had enough of that in my... Context. Yeah, First, first few years of my career, not just first, I think the first decade plus, I, I hardly paid attention to that. You know, I was doing well, I was, you know, getting good ratings and I was I think done. information was less available at that time. Possible. Today, Possible. It I mean, it was not the LinkedIn times, yeah, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was not the LinkedIn times and uh, we did less of, you know, Stack Overflow, we had less of Google, we knew less of what was happening in other companies. Mm -hmm. So, um, there were no meetups and conferences, yeah. seminars, yeah. hardly any. Mm -hmm. And so, we were all wound up in our own worlds. and Own uh, vacuum. Yeah, and I, I would say I did 100% of, you know, just do your work well. That's mm -hmm. it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, hoping that somebody is taking care of ensuring this continuum. Mm -hmm. um, and, and like I said, it was a dark night which made me realize that, it's not enough. Hmm. I need to do more. Right? So, w were the interview rejections a catalyst in you recognizing this is a dark time? Or was there something else? Like Both. if a person who's watching it, mm -hmm. they might be in it, but they are not sure if they are yeah. in it. How yeah. do they know? So, you know what? So, um, I think one is, of course, your interview rejections, but your interview rejections also indicate that you don't even have the skills. Mm -hmm. Right. So you're first of all, maybe you don't have the right skills, G, G. which are marketable at G, that point G. of time. Secondly, the of the skills that you have and, you know, which they are interviewing you for, sure. you're still you're not doing well. Right. 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 Um, and so no excuses there. You mm. you need to pull up your socks. Right. Whatever it be. Mm. Um, so either you uh, pivot your career 
right? That again is very difficult. I've seen people try to go from one field to another. It's not easy, Raghavan. Mm -hmm. There are no uh, sure shot formulas. You do this, 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 then yep, you get yep. to do this, right? Mm. Uh, nobody can give you a guarantee that you do these, these courses, you crack this, you'll get this. Like mm. earlier in life, you know, you study well, you'll get good marks. Mm. <laughs> right? There is no right permutation combination. There isn't. There mm. isn't. Mm. So you need to um, think of yourself as that product which is not doing well. What should I do? Mm. So when your chips are down, there are a lot of people around you mm. who sort of become philosophers. Yeah, yeah. Everyone around you becomes a philosopher and starts yeah. giving you gyan. Yeah, yeah. Now, I'm sure in your journey also, there would be some people around you or in your network yeah. who would have come and given you certain advices. Yeah. Now, I want to understand how seriously did you listen to them? If you did, did it help? And there would be a lot of things you ignored that really helped. So, talk to us a bit about yeah. that, that whole... Uh, uh, noise that yeah. comes when you start failing. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I think with the um, interview rejections around that time, right, um, and there were many, like I could go through, go on a drive in the city and be like, I flung this into wow. here. I flung this into No here. one would believe it now, but yeah. <laughs> you know, so, uh, and I'm connected with most of them on LinkedIn. <laughs> so. Right. Yeah, we'll send this yeah. podcast to them. No. <laughs> So, but I think, you know, failures at that point of time, like, you know, they, they do want to break it to you that, okay, these are the reasons not working. The yeah. talent acquisition person yeah, yeah, say, yeah. hey, they didn't like this bit, so it's not going to, it's not yeah. going to work out or whatever. So, uh, I mean, th there was a message in it, right? But I think, you know, that message was just to that interview, hmm. what they're telling me, right? Like you're saying, there are many people who will tell you. Um, you can choose to improve on that, but then you're still in that circle. Yeah, then. yeah. And and I and frankly, Raghav, I needed to get out of it. This was not clicking. This is this not happening. This is not happening for me. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I I don't see any growth for me in it. Um, I need to think of something else. Mm. Right? Um, I can tell you. I mean, like you know, uh, after all those rejections, when that interview offer that I got from Tektronix came through. I was so happy, mm -hmm. you know, I don't think I was that happy even with my first job. Even though I can. First job was like, yeah, obviously I will get a job so after I'm from engineering, engineering and I will get a job. But after those rejections. This felt like a rebirth? This was like, wow, yeah. I was so grateful. So, if we look at what you're saying, right, what we realize is that the second part of your career, mm -hmm. you would have changed as a professional. Yeah. And you would have changed in certain qualities where you would have become better. Yeah. Certain qualities you might have become worse. Yeah. And by worse, what I mean is things like loyalty towards the company. Yeah. yeah. Because now you realize that I am Yeah. I have, to <laughs> yes. look, I have to look out for my own interest. Yeah. Yeah. Did that happen? Absolutely, Raghav. I think you know um, that was a lesson almost, mm -hmm. right? That uh, I won't I won't say loyalty as much as that I need my skills to be up to date. Mm. There was no bigger lesson that I learned through that stretch, that dark, dark night as I call it, as, as that if I am not up to date, I am dead, right? Mm. So, uh, did, did, can we say that in some ways an insecurity sort of thing? Yeah. Because I look at insecurity in a very positive light personally. Yeah. yeah. Like whenever I am insecure of something, I know for a fact yeah. it will never go wrong. Yeah. Because I am always insecure about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Things that I'm not insecure yeah. are the ones where I mess up the most. Yeah. It's it's like also like when you're driving slow, right? Mm. Accidents can happen because mm. you're like little careless because you're anyway slow. But if you're driving fast, you pay attention that yeah. you, know, you shouldn't mm. do something wrong. Um, so very much like that, I think, you know, uh, after that time, I realized that I, I just need to be up to date. Yeah? Mm -hmm. This is, I don't want to go through this nonsense again. Mm -hmm. So, um, I need to be marketable. I need to be employable. Um, uh, I have financial commitment. I cannot slip on. So, mm -hmm. you know, that was that. You have used marketable word uh, two, three times. Mm -hmm. By marketable, in today's day, people talk personal branding. Ki baat karte. Ki we all need to have our own no, I'm personal brand. I'm maybe referring to marketable Job market. as, yes, more like employable. Okay. Right. Um, and, and that's important mainly because, let's say, you know, companies are, of course, doing well. But what if they don't? Mm -hmm. Right. What if there's a reason for them to crumble? I mean, that's what happened to Alcatel. Right. And so if if they are going through that time and then I am on my own. Yeah. Right, to yeah, your point. Yeah. And so in which case I need to have alternatives. Sure. Right? Sure. And so that's why I think, you know, that um, hustle came. That Did you also uh, get more detailed into financial literacy? Wearing, for example, for example, mm. normally when you are in a job and you have a stable source of income, mm. uh, you don't really think about 
times when the stability of that income will be in question. Mm -hmm. Now, what I am understanding because of those rejections, mm -hmm. again, not that it would have impacted yeah. directly. But I have to say no, I am still not very financially <laughs> literate. <laughs> Got the, it. Those are parts of my life I outsource to my husband, sure. my father-in-law. They take care of investments mm -hmm. and stuff. So. Um, but you would want to do it. I want to. Yeah. I want to. You're a daughter. I'm sure you are teaching her all along. Yeah, I want to improve, and yeah. so um, every now and then I do like some LinkedIn learning course <laughs> okay. or you know some Udemy course just to get. So um, I have a goal this year. I want to understand earnings calls. Right? Really? I want, yeah, I want to understand the terminologies. What it means. Wow. Okay. I'll let That's you know in Jan goal. if yeah. I have cracked it. Hmm. I've done some um, under reading and you know I think even in my current job I think they are trying to, yeah. uh, there are you know these uh, opportunities yeah. to learn. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm hoping I'll figure this out. Let's see how far I go. Hmm. Uh, starting with I started taking economic times just hmm. so that I throw all these unknown <laughs> words hmm. at hmm. myself. Hmm. I can go and you know um, Google them at least. Hmm. Uh, it's starting to look good as in I can talk mm. about Indian economy, Chinese economy, yeah. what is the difference, yeah. what's going wrong, etc, etc. And I yeah. think that's a start. Mm -hmm. But I still have that looming goal to target, right? Like I, mm. I want to understand earnings calls, right? Mm -hmm. So let's wow. see if it comes through. So now what we see is in your career, mm -hmm. post this break, mm. your, your trajectory sort of comes on that leadership track. Mm -hmm. What we see is that, that being a leader, mm -hmm. you get more and more amplified and we see that leadership track gaining traction, gaining speed. And what we have seen is as a leader, mm -hmm. the biggest quality you need is empathy. Yeah. And empathy comes from our own experiences yeah. when we can relate to yeah. more and more people. Yeah, yeah. So did these hardships sort of create empathy in you? In Absolutely, Raghav. So when I see others in the kind of situations that I was, right, like your skills are stale, my first thought is this could have been me. Right. And so even when I'm trying to tell them that, hey, you need to do this, this and this, hmm. I am always still telling them those lines from my stand. Hmm. Like, you know, I might have had that situation and I truly did. Right. Hmm. So um, I, I try to get them to be nervous and, you know, do hmm. that, hmm. not go through my situation. Right. Hmm. Um, sometimes it clicks, sometimes it doesn't because everybody's in their own spin. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I think, you know, my learning from this whole thing, Raghav, is that human beings are amazing. I mean, they can adapt, they can learn, they can, um, you know, reimagine yeah, situations, yeah. right? So, uh, you know, I, I don't think we can really prescribe. Sure, right? sure, You sure. can try to guide folks, uh, but, you know, once you give them a signal, hmm. people pick, it, pick up on it and then they really, um, you know, surprise you. Right. Mm -hmm. So empathy, yes, but I really love it. Like you give the small nudge sometimes, and people just do something so beautiful and come mm -hmm. right. So I really basically like that. understanding how their incentives are structured. Yes, yes, that's yes. what you're saying. Right? Yes, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So now, if you look at your overall career before we can get to writers, I've only heard good things. Like this was a good experience. This was a good experience. I'm sure there would be a, an experience or a couple of experience yeah. that would not be so great. Yeah, yeah. So can you tell us what makes an experience in a job not great? So I'll tell you, right, so in my current job, Raghav, I really love the I concept. know, I know. <laughs> I've told you, but I'll tell you what's uh, uh, the bad things which are missing, I'll tell yeah, you. Sure. <laughs> right? So um, I've, I've worked in jobs where, you know, the culture is extremely hierarchical nature of the industry or whatever, right? Um, and so there what happens, right? It really, I've experienced very stunted learning. Um, I, I want to be able to, you know, explore uh, and uh, learn explain about. How stunted learning, how does it I'll tell you. So mm -hmm. let us say, you know, I am, uh, you know, this uh, data analytics person. I, I, am, I, I come with the skill. This is a project I'm working on. Now, let us say this project is going to integrate with that team or that organization sure. into that uh, stack, whatever, right? So I want to know about that and maybe I will build a better solution or something different. But uh, if you are not able to navigate your way to that, huh. right, it is going to, uh, hmm. you know, prevent you from doing your best hmm. job. Hmm. 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 Or let's say um, if you knew more about what they are also trying to do, they are also trying to do, maybe you're going to create something more common. So this is what I mean by, you know, stunted growth. 
and uh, there are companies I think which maybe this is uh, you know not recognized that you know this is happening. Yeah, yeah. And things could go wrong. Um, it is not encouraged, likely, right? Um, and you know, there's a certain amount of uh, what do you say? Uh, political, you know, we say, you know, the environment is very political, right? So sometimes that could happen. And then that really prevents, you know, putting your best foot forward. When we talk about uh, corporate politics, mm, right, mm. there are two schools of thought. Mm. One thought is that ignore it, mm. that should not bother you. Mm. Other thought is play it because that's the nature of capitalism we are in. Mm. What do you think? I'm not very good at playing it. Everyone says that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the I best know, I players really say that. I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm yeah? Just, I'm just no, kidding. I really am not good at playing just it. Kidding. But I see the others play it and uh, uh, I, I don't regret it though. Right? Like some Morally like, or not against it? Morally. I'm not against it. I guess that's their skill. That's their nature. Yeah, that's their nature. That's their skill. And so uh, they are making some wirings happen. But... Um, what I hope is, you know, this is just the optimistic side of me that I hope they don't kill somebody who can't play it. Fair enough. Right? Well, that's, that's the only thing. Mm. Uh, I hope, you know, people with the Casualty right... Casualty should not happen. Yes. The right skills, the right attitude, they shouldn't get discouraged because mm. of this. Then you're losing it because of mm. all your politics. So you do it and also ensure that there's a placeholder for all these, you know, excited folks, enthusiastic mm -hmm. folks, right? Mm. Take them along in your <laughs> yeah. political agenda. Yeah. So I think that's fair and that I think happens. Fair enough. And I think the overall culture around politics has a lot to do with your manager. Yeah. A lot to do with your boss. Yeah. Because a lot of bosses encourage it. Yeah. And a lot of bosses are having a very strict yeah. thought process around it. So yeah. according to you, what makes a good boss? Yeah. And what makes a toxic boss? Yeah. I've seen bosses, Raghav, who are... Um, uh, you know, let's say they're not my boss per se, but they have been a boss who's been like, let's say very like, you know, there's this Chanakya saying, right? The straight trees will be cut first, mm -hmm, right? Yeah. So somewhat like that. So they are very, um, you know, true and they are very righteous, right? Um, they are not able to sustain in such a political setup, Agreed. right? Agreed. And so then what happens is if you're in their team, obviously they are, those are those happy days because, you know, working for somebody who's so right and all of that stuff. But then um, there's not enough growth. And uh, some people call them naive. Yeah. And so then what happens is, you know, you're not, there's not enough growth that comes for you. Mm -hmm. So there's that. Uh, at the same time, if you're working for somebody who's really petty and doesn't see then like it's a, a other that's, ball game. Yeah. Right. Mm. So there are, you know, <laughs> challenge, challenges mm. with both. Um, but I think, you know, you definitely need somebody who is an inspiration for mm. you or um, they know that. Um, so I, I know this, that, you know, um, I am the least capable person in the team. And mm. my strength lies in all the in, in the collective strength of the team. Yeah. Right. So that point of view, if your leader doesn't have. Right, I think every works. great leader has that point of view. I hope so. I have talked to founders who are running my billion dollar companies, many of them. Mm -hmm. And this is a common thing they all say. Mm -hmm. My job is to hire people smarter than me. Yeah. Yeah. That's Must my only be. job. Yeah. Otherwise, you'd be really foolish if you mm -hmm. don't, right? Mm -hmm. Even today, I met uh, somebody uh, at my son's school, Raghav, who said that, how can you go to all these meetups and talk in all these podcasts? <laughs> uh, don't you get scared that people might know more than you? And I said, Obviously, I'm not scared. Like, obviously, there are tons of youngsters yeah. who know stuff way more than me. But mm. I'm hoping that my experience yeah. and their knowledge can converge and we can create something beautiful. Mm. Right? Mm. So that's the hope. Wow. So now let's come to uh, Thomson, Thomson Reuters. Yeah. A lot of mystique around that brand, about that organization. Mm -hmm. I think Reuters, a lot of people know as a news outlet. Yeah, news of, agency. Of agency. Yeah. Yeah. So can you explain to us what is Thomson Reuters? I'll and try. How does Reuters fit into that? Yeah, I'll try, right? So, um, Reuters, as you already know, is the uh, news agency. Which is right in the world. Yeah, it, and, and we have the largest Reuters bureau actually in Bangalore. Do come to our office sometime. Yeah, Definitely. Uh, and uh, TR, uh, Thomson Reuters, uh, is not just Reuters, right? So, it's also got um, these legal research products. Um, you may have heard of Westlaw, which is a competitor Lexus Nexus yeah. that you said. Yeah. So, um, uh, I think TR produces Westlaw and, you know, that suit of products. Also, we produce products for uh, legal workflow, legal productivity solutions, right? Do you guys do services also in that? 
uh, I think we do professional services to help integrate with the but ecosystem. But not as a uh, IT service play kind of thing? No, not, not really, not. I guess. And then we also have similar products on the tax and accounting side for you know, research as well as, let's hmm. say, tax workflows, right? So we integrate with, you know, uh, tax, direct tax, indirect tax solutions. We um, help with a lot of compliance, sure, regulatory sure. intelligence yeah, yeah. kind of products. So hmm. that too, along with... Uh, Hmm. Reuters. I Perfect. Would say. And currently in, in Reuters, what have you guys been doing in your particular in the engineering department? Anything new that you can talk about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I can. That would be great. I mean, I I think uh, uh, there's ample noise all over with generative AI. Genii, 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 genii. So obviously that color is on us as well. <laughs> And so uh, we, I have been breathing, sleeping, dreaming, eating, eating only <laughs> generative AI uh, since I think Jan or Feb this year. Mm. Uh, we've had some uh, interesting in-house pieces come out, mm -hmm. worked with some open source content. Um, uh, our you know, internal teams, uh, science, research scientists and uh, ML engineers, right? They are pivoting to this whole generative AI way of working. Um, and law has one of the biggest use cases of generative Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, you know, some of our best minds are at work, such um, interesting uh, ways of looking at how might we serve our solutions is coming out right um, added to which this is this whole generation of co-pilot mm. have you heard of the Microsoft co-pilot obviously, obviously. right so obviously every org in the in the company and I'm sure every company is rethinking their workflows their business processes with AI efficiencies coming mm. in mm. Um, and so we are also you know we have these really interesting discussions that how is it going to look two years hence Right? And I'm sure everybody, every professional is thinking, you know, two years hence, what's going to happen? I'll ask you a very broad level. Yeah. Let's say Thomson Reuters is in two major industries as far as I see. Mm -hmm. One industry can be called legal law. Yeah. And the other can be said as media or news, whatever you call it. Yeah, yeah. Now, these two industries, at a broad level, how do you think AI is going to impact in the next five, ten years, whatever? What is the so I see my, backiest um, thought process you have? Yeah, so... Um, let me let me talk about the journalists, sure, right? Sure. And it's not wacky because it's happening. They are the professionals who I see have embraced generative AI into their work. And by that, I don't mean that generative AI is going to generate the articles, then, right? Um, so they have kind of built formulae around leveraging generative workflows. AI to do the workflows, to do the background research, mm. right? Figure out five questions I should ask about this. Certain bots they have yeah, trained. Yeah. Um, figure out five sources where I could get this from, right? So those are, you know, things which we could uh, definitely leverage generative AI for. Um, translations. What about fake news? How, how prevalent will that get because of... Um, I, I, I don't think we are going to be, you know, doing that at all. No, not but you guys. I'm, what I mean I'm is, I'm generally know, talking. Yeah, generally talking as well. I think fake news, um, you know, there's this whole research going on around watermarking the output from a generative AI algorithm. Yeah, yeah. So if that, with that, with such technologies and with maybe um, other push around us, like leveraging other kind of technologies. I, recently, I saw this interesting work done by folks from Reuters, along with Canon, where they will blockchain and in, ensure that there are no fake photos, right? So they will have, you know, where it's clicked, what was the processing it underwent, wow. right? So that's sort of like an NFT. Sort of like NFT. So like blockchain plus AI what, yeah. building, you know, really good. Mm -hmm. art. So like that, I don't think we will have fake news as a problem much. Hmm. Um, that's my belief. Like AI can solve for it. You see, even if AI is the problem, it can solve for it. Yes. Mm -hmm. AI is a problem just maybe like very temporary for, sure. you know, um, cheap <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. setups, but mm, not mm. otherwise. I, I don't think we will ever this thing. Mm. Um, what AI and uh, not just AI, right? Like what digital services is allowing for uh, Raghav is, you know, more equal access to news. And the same will happen even for, you know, legal services and legal research. So you will have more easy access to, I mm. think, you know, um, what should I do now? Mm. 
kind of questions. So mm. the whole access to justice line is going to be uh, easier to enable, I think, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and not just uh, access to justice. We've also got products around, like, say, tax and um, sure, sure. regulatory intelligence. So if I want to, let's say, uh, do business with Middle East, right, what is it that, what all should I, where should I start? Sure, right? sure. Mm -hmm. What are those laws I should be mindful, careful around? So yeah. all of those are much easier now to yeah, get access yeah, to, yeah. right? Hmm. And I think generative AI is in a way enabling that. Hmm. Yeah. Perfect. So I think the last segment that we have, uh, as I've been seeing, I've been seeing you speak, one thing I realize is that this diversity across not just gender, but also people with disabilities is something which is very close to your heart. Yeah. And you've always been very vocal about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and as we were discussing that there's a business impact to it as well that you see. So talk to us a bit about uh, what do you think is diversity mm -hmm. and what do you think uh, or why do you think companies should embrace it more? Yeah. So, um, you know, there's this whole equal versus equity mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. picture, right? So, uh, I, I really do think that, you know, uh, it's very important to have diversity. And I'm not just saying this because I've heard this, right? I, I think, you know, um, different people with different backgrounds bring a very different perspective to the work and you will miss it altogether if you don't have it, right? Um, I wish I could actually quote what I heard from you, Raghav, because I mm -hmm. think that's one of the best examples. Uh, but even, even in our day-to-day -day work, right, like the perspectives that um, folks from different backgrounds bring in is not to be missed because you will hurt the solution getting built if you, you know, uh, yeah. not listen to one part of it. Now, that is one. Now, the second thing is it's also better business, right? You do want to sell solutions which are unbiased to, you know, different uh, strata of society, different sections of society. So, so having that um, diverse input enables to have, you know, solutions getting built for different parts of the society. Now, um, when you said, you know, folks with disability, and when I'm thinking of, you know, my my company, which is producing products for better access to justice, better sure. access to, let's say, regulatory intelligence, better access to news, right? I want folks, I, I want, you know, every part of the society, all members of the society to have an equal or equitable reach to it. Now, are we really designing solutions for that? This is the whole accessibility, you know, uh, point of view, right? So, um, and, and that's why it's important that, you know, we are mindful that you know there are these different sections in the society we ought to build solutions for them mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. uh, they are they are maybe workforce that we are missing out on they will probably bring in perspectives which will be you know very unique to the solution that we are developing and it's wrong to not bring that in hmm. right. so i have two final questions for you yeah one question is that you are a person who i see introspects a lot analyzes a lot the world in general, mm -hmm. uh, like what is happening around us, and you are also seeing the way technology is shifting. What scares you about the next 10, 15 years for humankind? I'm not scared, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not scared, Raghav. I'm, but if you um, had to have like one, one thought, right? Or what do you think, like generally, next 10, 15 years for humankind? So you... There's a lot of, you know, polarizing that's happening, right? Um, but I don't think, uh, you know, that's, so like when you stir a glass of water with mud, so there, that's that state now. Mm. But eventually it will settle, eventually the different kinds of particles will yep. have a position. Yep. So yep. I feel in 10, 15 years, we will get there. Mm -hmm. Maybe there'll be some other churn. Sure, sure. But, you know, this churn that we see, this polarizing, you know, this uh, sort of uh, political situation that yep. we see at yep. times, Will eventually settle, mm -hmm. right? There'll be new uh, macros and new micros which come up, but uh, you know that's that's a journey. I think we need to go there. But I think polarization is something that I do agree with. Yeah. Be it the opinions that people have. Yeah. Or be it, look at the regimes, political yeah. regimes across the globe. And, and I think social media lets you have target. that safety in your polarized yeah. opinion. Yes, right? you target it. Yeah. You like put all those people together yeah. to make them feel they're right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what it is. Yeah, and so if all of them got together in a playground or an open space, yeah. right, they would probably not express their polarized views. Yeah, yeah. But because they are in the comfort of their digital world, Agreed. maybe they feel safer hmm. to do so or what? Yeah. Perfect. So one last question that I always ask. So I'm 23 years old. So I want one piece of advice you will give to any 23-year-old that is watching this podcast that 
you believe uh, if you were 23 someone told you ah uh, okay so i think you know opportunities are limitless hmm. right uh, and 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 your destination is going to keep changing hmm. like you want this and then when you're somewhat headed that will be like oh i want that hmm. right hmm. so you know just have an open mind and just hmm. go with the flow and perfect i guess opportunities go with the just, flow yes. i like it yeah. that's a lovely way to end it i think uh, this is just the first podcast we have done with her i think there are a lot of topics that we can go really really deep so would really appreciate if we can do this again sure probably next year we would also know how much you know about earning calls and all of that <laughs> that <laughs> yes. we should know so thank you so much for coming really really appreciate it thank, thank you. you raghav thank you so much for thank the opportunity you. thank you